You know, that was a blessing this morning. Thank you. Thank you. What a blessing. Um, I don't know if they still do this or not, but at McDonald's, at least they used to supersize your meal if you asked for it. At Wendy's, they'll biggie size your meal. At Sonic, they'll Sonic size it. At Whataburger, they'll Wada size it. Even at Jack's, you have a big Jack sandwich and then you have a bigger Jack sandwich. Now all those are ways for them to, um, to give you something that's out of the ordinary. Something that is larger than the regular size. Yes, you, you increase your chance for a heart attack, but it also gives you something that is out of the ordinary. Something that is bigger than a regular size. Bigger than the ordinary. And I want to suggest to you in our scripture passage this morning, Jesus is telling us and teaching us how to supersize our relationships with him. How to take an ordinary relationship the way it's always been to a whole nother level to the way that it can be. A relationship that is just a cookie cutter relationship as to how everybody else that we know is experiencing Jesus to a whole nother level. And once you have supersized, once you have learned the power of supersizing your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're never going to want to go back to a regular, regular size order of Jesus. Because the supersize is life transforming. Well, we come to the end, kind of, of this sermon series that I've been preaching called The Sacred Selfie. And in the sacred selfie, we have been looking at these I am statements by Jesus in the Gospel of John that if Jesus was going to post a selfie on social media, on his social media page, that, that he would have a selfie um, of the bread of life, of the light of the world, of the gate for the sheep, of the good shepherd, of the resurrection and the life, of the way, the truth, and the life. All of those would be on Jesus, part of Jesus' selfie, as if you will. And now we come to the last one. Well, I say it's kind of the last one because I'm actually going to add one on next week because there is another I am statement by Jesus, but it's found in the book of Revelation. And I'll let you find it in preparation for next Sunday. Um, but here in John chapter 15, Jesus shows us how to supersize our relationships with Jesus Christ. Shows us how to take them out of the ordinary realm, but into the supersized realm. Into the realm that where other people will look at and go, I want to be as close to Jesus as she is, as he is. More than a dabbling in Jesus, but the supersized relationship. Now, I'm going to be reading John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. And in this morning, I'm going to focus on just two words in this passage. One is abide, 
or there may be a, another form of the word abide. And then two, there the word is fruit. Okay? And so that's going to be the gist of this morning's message. And so if somebody asks you after church today that wasn't here, if they, they say, well, what did Brother Steve preach about? Just say, abiding in fruit, and you'll have it. Okay? That, that's basically what I'm going to preach on, but here's what I want you to do. I'm going to read the first 11 verses. I'm going to read this morning from um, John chapter 15 from the New King James Version. I normally use a New International Version, but because of the word abide, I'm going to read from the New King James Version because I love that word. The New International Version uses the word remain. Now, that's a good word. But I personally love the word abide. And the reason why is simply this. Because I don't use it in any other context. Now, you may. But if I say remain, I may use it in a whole other context. But abide, if I use the word abide, you can pretty much guarantee I'm talking about Jesus. And so I'm choosing the New King James Version this morning. So I want you to count the number of times you hear or read the word abide or a form of that word. You may want to circle them or underline them or just do little tally marks in your sermon notes. Whatever works for you. Jesus is speaking. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Here's the first one. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Now these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may, be, may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Now, um, because I don't hear well, and because masks make it extra difficult, show me with your hands how many times you saw the word abide. 10, 10, 10, negative 3. Um, I mean, 10, 10 times. 10 times. Y'all are, y'all are good at math. I, I, I had to go through it several times and I came up with different answers. Um, until I finally kept coming up with, with 10. Now, doesn't it stand to reason if a single word is used 10 times in just 11 verses that God is trying to tell us something? Go like this. Okay? God, I mean, it, it, 10 times 
times in just 11 verses. You don't see the word abide in very many, other many, very many other places in Scripture. But here in John 15, in 11 verses, 10 times. Like I said earlier, the New International Version translates the original Greek. The Greek word is meno. Now, remain is a good translation, but the word meno literally means to dwell in, to settle in, to sink deeper in, to hang out with. Abiding in Jesus isn't visiting him for an hour on Sunday morning and then spending the other hours of your week doing whatever you want to do. Or abiding in Jesus isn't spending time in the morning or in the evening with the quiet time or a devotion time, whatever you want to call it, and then forgetting about them the rest of the day or not thinking about them and just getting on with the rest of your life. Abiding in Jesus is to hang out with them, to stay with them, to sink deeper. Now let me show you why I think that is important. Look at verse 5. Um, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Think about it. Apart from him, you can do nothing. A branch that is cut off from the vine cannot produce fruit. The only way a branch can produce fruit is by being connected to the vine. Let that soak in just a little bit. Um, in verse 3, Jesus says, You are already clean because of the words that I have spoken to you. Who does the cleaning here? The Word of God, which does the cleaning. You know, in our culture, we tend to have this, buy into this self-help, self-determination kind of um, philosophy. You know what I mean? If it's going to be, it's up to me, right? If I'm going to to be a good person, then it's up to me to make myself into a good person. If I'm going to get my attitude under control, if I'm going to have an attitude that honors God, if my mouth is going to honor God, if I'm going to do the things that I need to do that God would want me to do, and if I'm not going to do the things that God does not want me to do, if it's going to be, it's up to me, right? Not so much. Not according to Jesus. You see, Jesus didn't buy into that self-help, if it's going to be, it's up to me kind of strategy. That's a worldly strategy. That's why so many of us, we fail over and over trying to make those changes that we know we need to make. Have you ever tried to start doing something that you know you need to start doing, but then you fail over and over to start doing it? Or how about this? Have you ever tried to stop doing something that you know you shouldn't be doing, but you keep doing it anyway. Anybody? I'm there. I'm there. You see, the, if it's up to me, or if, if it's going to be, it's up to me strategy, doesn't clean me up. Let me see if I can bring it home for you. Have, have you ever cooked something in the oven, baked something in the oven, um, and 
at some point while you were baking it, something kind of spilled over into the pan and it just got caked on that pan and you took it out of the oven, you took the food out, then you tried to wash that pan. It's hard to do, isn't it? It's hard to do. Now you have two options as I say it. One is you can scrub that pan till your knuckles are raw or you can rub what? You can fill the sink with hot water, squirt a little dish soap in there, and let it soak. Because when that pan, a.k.a. that life, has that crud stuck on it that you can't get off, it takes soaking to loosen it up so it can be removed. Think of abiding as soaking in Jesus. Soaking in his love. Soaking in his power. In his presence. Where Jesus permeates every part of you. Even those hard to reach areas. Even those habits that that you have tried and failed over and over to get a handle on. You know, addictions, those things that we have tried and failed over and over to stop doing or maybe to start doing, but we are powerless against it. See, the secret isn't scrubbing hard the secret is soaking. Soaking in Jesus. Or how about that young lady that I mentioned earlier in the service that didn't feel loved. The more she soaks in the love of Jesus, the more that love of Jesus permeates every aspect of a being. That she is loved because God says that she is loved. And that is the truest thing about her. She is not unloved or unworthy because she hadn't found her man yet. Because true love comes from soaking in Jesus Christ, in His love, and letting that love permeate everything. Abide in my love, Jesus says in verse 9, if I remember right. Mm. The second word is fruit. Fruit. Now, fruit. Um, is found six times in these 11 verses. Same principle holds true. Same principle. If one ver word is found six times in just 11 verses, your radar signal should go up and say, okay, God is trying to tell me something here. Six times in 11 verses. In fact, if you go all the way um, down to verse 16 in this passage, you'll see the word fruit two more times. In verse 2, we go from no fruit to fruit to more fruit. In verses 5 and 8, we go to much fruit. And in verse 16, we go to fruit that will last is all about fruit for the branches. It's all about fruit. Mm. You know, the purpose of the branch is to bear fruit. Not, not to be happy. Not to have everything 
everything go my way. That's good. I like that. We all do. But the purpose of the branch is to bear fruit. Now let me draw your attention to something here. Verse 2. It says this. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. In the New International Version, it cuts to the chase. He says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he cuts off. He just cuts off. Jesus goes on. And every branch in me or that bears fruit, he prunes so that it bears more fruit. Here's my question. How many branches are cut? Short answer, all of them. Every one. If a branch that is not bearing fruit is going to be cut off, thrown into the fire to be burned. Because it's worth it. A branch that is bearing fruit is going to be pruned so that it will bear more fruit. So here's my question to you. If Jesus is going to cut you either way, doesn't it make sense to let him fight you? <laughs> Doesn't it make sense to let him prune you <coughs> rather than cutting you off and throwing you in the fire? If you're going to be cut, either way, isn't it better to be cut so that you can bear fruit rather than being burned up? Hmm. Fruit. Fruit. Let me give you uh, three truths about fruit. Number one, the character of the vine determines the nature of the fruit. The character of the vine determines the nature of the fruit. Simply put, orange trees do not grow pears. Pear trees do not grow lemons. Lemon trees do not grow satsumas. And fig trees don't grow pomegranates. The character of the vine or of the tree is going to determine the nature of the fruit. And Jesus does not grow bitterness. And Jesus does not grow envy. And Jesus does not grow a self-serving attitude, but Jesus grows humility. And Jesus grows love. And Jesus grows joy. And Jesus grows peace because the character of the vine determines the nature of the fruit. Second truth I want you to see, fruit is always visible. Fruit is visible. Don't go telling me, yes, I follow Christ, but I keep my fruit hidden. The purpose of fruit isn't supposed to be hidden. It's to be visible. People can see it. People will be able to see your fruit. Whether it's bad fruit or whether it's good fruit, people can see it because fruit by its very nature is visible. Thirdly, fruit always exists for the betterment of someone else. Fruit does not exist so that the branch will have an easier life. Fruit exists for the betterment of someone else. So someone else can benefit. So when you abide in Jesus 
And when you soak in his love, and when, you know, when that fruit begins to grow, you know who benefits? Your family. Your school. Your workplace. Your community. Your world. fruit six times in just 11 verses abide 10 times in 11 verses abiding is the key to the super size relationship with Jesus it's not trying hard it's not the, if it's going to be, it's up to me. How many times have you tried that and failed? Why? Because it was never intended to get you to where you're wanting to be. But soaking in Jesus will let that rhyme away. Let me close with this story. There were two elderly, an elderly couple. They had been married over 60 years. Finally, they got to the point where they couldn't take care of themselves. And so their children had to make the very, very difficult decision of putting them in a nursing home. But when the, they put them, put them in the nursing home, the nursing home didn't have a double room available. And so the wife was in one room, the husband was in another room. And they saw each other every chance they get, but their health, both of them, they were almost mirror images of one another. Their health continued to deteriorate. And in fact, the day came where the children knew that both of them were dying. It wasn't going to be long. So they convinced the um, administration at the nursing home to allow them to move their father into the room of their mother. And then they situated the two beds where they were lying parallel to one another, where he could reach his bony fingers through the, the gaps on the hospital bed. She could reach hers through the gaps and they held hands. They couldn't speak. But the love that was in that room was so thick, so deep. The husband died first. Took his last breath. The doctor was in there and told the children that he's gone. But the children looked up there at the, at the heart monitor. And it was still beeping. And they questioned the doctor about it. Well, if daddy's gone, how, how, how come the heart monitor is still beeping? And the doctor smiled and, and said, my friends, her heart is beating through his heart. When you abide in Jesus, his heart will beat through your heart. The fruit will grow. Your family will benefit. And people will want to come take a bite out of you. Because you're growing fruit that will last. But the fruit of the Spirit is this. Love, joy, <coughs> peace, forbearance, and other versions, patience.
kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. The call this morning, don't just visit with Jesus. Abide in Jesus. Don't just drop in for a social visit. Suck in. Sing page 419. I am thine, O Lord. Sing, we're going to sing verses 1, 2,